short-term arbitrage or long-term strategy. Either way, it's time for supplement brands to start hedging those TikTok shop bets. Before I get into the supplement industry implications, let's first cover some details around what provided the inspiration for this content. It shouldn't be news to anyone at this point, but the US House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a bill earlier this month that would give ByteDance about six months to divest the US assets of TikTok or face a ban. If that desired result sounds familiar, it's because the idea of a TikTok ban has roots in the Trump administration. In fact, a deal was even worked out where Oracle would become a minority investor with 12.5% stake in ByteDance and start hosting its American user data in the US firm's cloud infrastructure. Additionally, Walmart would purchase a 7.5% stake in ByteDance based on a commercial partnership likely involving TikTok Shop. And while that 20% minority share seems insubstantial in terms of the business power dynamics, it, like most political things, are almost always about optics. Because when you consider that at the time, 40% of ByteDance was owned by US venture capital firms, the Trump administration could technically claim TikTok would now be majority owned by US money. Regardless, that deal eventually fell through and Trump's ban was struck down by a federal court. By the time Biden came to office, he rolled back Trump's executive order and began private negotiations with TikTok and its parent company. And before I get into why these old head lawmakers are trying to ban a popular Gen Z app anyways, let's take a step back to make sure you know ByteDance basics. For those unaware, ByteDance, nicknamed the App Factory, was founded in 2012 and is now valued at just under $300 billion. To put that in perspective, it's about the same size as Coca-Cola, Netflix, or Chevron. ByteDance is often seen as the world's leading company in algorithms because its flagship apps TikTok and TikTok's sister app in China are powered by commanding recommendation engines that make its app extremely attractive to users. And it's those powerful algorithms that are at the heart of this debate. Because while most of these old heads in DC are lucky if they understand anything substantial about today's technological advancements, some of their national security concerns are legitimate. I should also add that while there is this kind of debate going on, what mostly started as a hot button topic for conservative politicians has become a bipartisan issue ahead of the current election cycle. To keep this relatively simple, these American lawmakers are concerned about TikTok's relationship with mainland China. Like with most big Chinese companies, China's ruling Communist Party has set up a party branch at ByteDance. Scrutiny over ByteDance expanded further after the government took a 1% stake in its local subsidiary, Beijing ByteDance Technology, in 2019 that awarded the Chinese government a board seat at the subsidiary. So American lawmakers are worried that the Chinese government will pressure ByteDance to share US data gathered on TikTok, which the CCP could potentially use for nefarious reasons. One such concern surrounds the CCP utilizing TikTok's algorithm to censor videos, disseminate misinformation, and otherwise influence the feeds of American citizens. TikTok has repeatedly denied ever passing American user data along to the Chinese government, but the company representatives have admitted to video censorship and wouldn't commit to cutting off Chinese employees' access to American data. But before I get myself any further into the weeds on this topic, I want to kind of pull myself back out of that and stay focused here. I'll wrap up this section with a bit of my game theory breakdown. Firstly, the probability that TikTok will manage to maneuver a divestment is unlikely. And interestingly enough, ByteDance is now 60% owned by global institutional investors. But even more likely, the ban TikTok rhetoric slows down, at least until the American election cycle is over. This is already what you're seeing from the Senate, essentially slow playing the TikTok bill, blaming the very large backlog of legislative priorities making their way through the Commerce Committee. But I'm not sure this strategy helps one political party over another. Biden already stated he would sign any legislation that gets to his desk, but the heaviest TikTok users are young adults, which 
are very important to Democrats that are reliant upon them to have a strong turnout in key swing voting districts. So maybe that hurts them in the current election cycle. On the other hand, Trump has somewhat reversed course, taking a more balanced approach on his disdain that likely looks at also placing stronger controls on domestic technology companies like Facebook. In that regard, maybe it hurts Republicans in future election cycles. But that all hinges on the belief that many young Americans are single issue voters. And that single issue would be TikTok and other digital platforms. Weird to think that would be the case, but hey, even as someone that studies consumer behavior every day, I'm still constantly left scratching my head over what large swaths of Americans think and do. Regardless, this is a lose-lose situation in my eyes. While I'm not advocating for communism, the benefit of countries like China is that they play long-term strategic games because of an authoritarian one-party dictatorship and a hierarchical business environment. So, Seeing the moves ahead, ByteDance, which would be strongly influenced by the CCP, wouldn't agree to sell TikTok, and that would put our government in a tough position. Taking out the American election voting consideration, banning TikTok would likely create retaliatory restrictions from the CCP. And that's a risky proposal, as China is the largest import market and third largest export market for the United States. You also then must think that any TikTok ban would likely need to be enforced by Google and Apple, both of which generate billions annually from Chinese companies or consumers. In fact, Apple captured 17.3% of the Chinese smartphone market in 2023, the largest portion of any company. You take that away from those two companies that make up, I think, around 8% of the S&P 500 and the US stock market plunges, causing an even bigger issue for politicians. So then what? Whichever administration wins the 2024 election cycle will get eventually desperate and end up walking back the ban over short-term economic impacts. On the other hand, if American lawmakers don't do anything from the start, they set a horrible precedence and that all but guarantees the CCP's grand strategy is successful, which is China becoming the most powerful nation in the world. Fun to think about, right? So maybe consider that clusterfuck the next time you make fun of those leading or proxy leading our country. But let's put all that messy shit to the side and talk about the wonderful world of TikTok Shop that launched in the US market only six months ago. For those unfamiliar, TikTok Shop brings shoppable videos and live streams directly to For You feeds, giving brands, merchants, and creators the tools to sell directly through shoppable content on the TikTok app. TikTok shop would be a form of shop attainment dubbed social commerce, but essentially social commerce allows consumers to explore products and complete transactions through social media and content creation platforms, all in an app. This emerging form of shopping removes friction from the buying process, creates a more engaging journey for the consumer, and presents new opportunities for brands to generate consumer interest. Only a few months after its launch in the US market, more than 5 million new customers purchased something via TikTok shop during the Black Friday and Cyber Monday shopping holiday season. In 2024, TikTok shop in the US market is expected to grow its business tenfold to as much as 17 and a half billion in gross merchandise value. But that aggressive growth target could be difficult considering TikTok shop is raising commissions, it charges merchants, and simultaneously reducing subsidies to customers after the app lost a reportedly half billion dollars in 2023. That being said, the meteoric rise of TikTok and its social commerce arm still offers savvy supplement brands a plethora of opportunities from brand storytelling to sales expansion and various collaboration strategies. Whether it's Fit Talk or Gym Talk advice, Hot Girl Walks, Hydration in those Stanley Cups, or Under Desk Treadmills, TikTok has defined many health trends. So it shouldn't surprise you that as much as 85% of the total US market TikTok shop sales were with health and beauty products. One of the biggest of those categorical brands has been Rise. And here's kind of a snippet from my recent conversation with its founder, Nick Stella, about the power of leveraging TikTok. Let's talk TikTok a little bit because I think- Oh boy. I think um, 
Here's, here's my take on it. Obviously, and you mentioned this a little bit at the beginning of the, the conversation, like you are somebody that has been seeing internet, um, you know, kind of how to connect content, commerce, like all that stuff for a very long time. Like it's, it, this yeah. isn't something new, like where you saw, you know, SEO, Google's type stuff, you saw social media, you saw whatever. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now you're, you're seeing TikTok and you guys jumped in like head first, arguably like one of the brands in our space that I think has done the the best job at diving into it and realizing the power of TikTok. We were the biggest number one health brand. At one point, we were top five in all of TikTok sales shop. Um, so we have owned that market. But just from a TikTok perspective, years ago when COVID happened, we we jumped on there. We saw the trend. Um, <clears throat> and even though it's a younger audience, we saw a way to get reached. So like the number one thing I look at as a brand is eyeballs. Like, how do you get more eyeballs? How do you get people to view your product? And at the time, every platform was switching over to video content. So I feel like a lot of these CEOs, CMOs, they don't look at the important picture of things, right? I didn't get on TikTok to sell more. I got on TikTok to learn how to make good short form content that then does good on YouTube and Instagram. And the reason for that is you were being pushed more on TikTok and it was easier to find out what was working. And through that, I found like how to build, like my Instagram's grown. I, we probably have one of the biggest YouTubes just from YouTube shorts. We grew like 70,000 subscribers in the matter of a year. Like for me, it's finding tools and finding out how to put out the best content you can and learn the quickest. Because in this industry, if you don't learn quick, you're falling behind. So, I mean, TikTok shops specifically, we already kind of own the fitness space on TikTok. So when we got in, we just absolutely blew up. It was crazy. It was, we did like $11 million in a week on TikTok shop alone. So it's, it's insane. I, I've seen a few times, um, uh, you know, some of their internal rankings and, and things like that and, and having you, you guys be up there. I was just like, I could see why. And to your point, like learning for years, how to like hone in storytelling through the way in which people want to now digest information, like how they expect it, how they were ever like, it's really yeah a matter of understanding and going back to like, you know, brands and stories and like how that's just kind of it is it, at the end of the day, you have to understand, I guess the consumer journey or the shopping journey or whatever that is like starts with a lot of just like hits across brand touch points across like they're, they're hearing different stories they are hearing wherever it is. But I'm, I'm thinking back to like a story with um, Greg Lavecchia from um, Bloom. He, yeah. he spoke a lot about understanding kind of that where is our customer? Like, where are they intersecting throughout their days? Like really mapping out like a day-to-day -day of our, our core customer and making sure that we are within those touch points across the board and not thinking about it from, to your point, selling. It's just, we want to get very authentic brand touch points that if eventually when somebody goes in from discovery to consideration down to the purchase you know, funnel, like they are going to think about us. They're probably going to select us and give us a shot. And if we believe we have a great product, um, we know not only we're going to get that one sale, we're probably going to get multiple sales because we know there's some retention piece to that, but it's a matter so that's of that's important too. make sure you have a good product. A lot of people just put products out there and I'm like, Ugh. like you got to make sure it's good or there, you can get a sale, but are they going to come back? Cause we look at LTV, right? Like we're not just looking at a one-time conversion. Typically people stay with us for four, five, six purchases in a month repeatedly. So like, if you can have a good product, you can count that into your marketing as well. Yeah. So it's, it's super important, I guess, to just think about, g get away from this, I guess, period of time where, and arguably this is probably, you know, you said 2020, 2021, like the, the iOS kind of like the shift of everything and, and just each also culturally the shift of like how people were, um, you know, finding uh, information, consuming information, whatever. There was this like, I guess, combination or 
congruence of all this stuff together that like ended up creating what now people have to move away from this like mathematical performance, like modeling of like, um, how am I going to arbitrage things into, wait a minute, we have to go back that to never worked either. People thought like these crazy funnels with like, all right, we're going to, we're going to do this outreach campaign with this seven day funnel, 14 day funnel, 30 day. That never works. Like you just need to show people good content. Like these gurus of Facebook ads too, like, you're not doing anything different. You're putting an ad out there and you're getting views and you're paying for it. Sure, there might be some little tweaks you can do on audience matching and whatever, but they're not doing anything to get you more sales. It's what content you're putting out there. And until you understand that, you're never going to be successful. This evolution of social interaction and commerce presents a transformative opportunity for functional CPG brands. But as you likely picked up from that clip, it's integral that you fully utilize and master storytelling on the TikTok platform to shuttle customers from awareness to conversion. It also helps if you have a robust creator strategy like Rise does that can drive traffic in a great impulse product like an energy drink that creates repurchases on platform or through other sales channels. But don't let those huge rise TikTok shop sales numbers blind you because there are still risks for functional CPG brands beyond those stemming from the total ban of TikTok. Now, I don't want to be the type of person that throws the baby out with the bathwater because I wholeheartedly believe that TikTok, like many social media platforms, provide an amazing mechanism to disseminate valuable information. But just to be pretty blunt here, that has a double-edged sword effect, and TikTok has unfortunately become a rising source of health misinformation. Then toss in potential creator commissions from TikTok shop supplement category sales, and those loud praises for products or ingredients in some cases come way too close to the line of making disease treatment claims. And this was something I recently talked about with one of the top CBG industry lawyers, Ryan Lewenden. Since we're on the on the topic of TikTok, I think this is probably a a topic that, again, from a from your perspective as a lawyer, like I think people are missing it, and maybe you can give me give some some insights on this. Is like, especially when I'm talking about the type of CPG that I tend to probably focus a lot of my attention on. There are there are claims. There's some functionality to the product. There's something out there, and then you have, you know, this commerce. I guess, arm um, of like TikTok shop that then has creators that are out there and they're incentivized to sell and they probably maybe are creating sensationalized claims or they're using whatever because they don't really know. I mean, a lot of people don't know the FTC rules of just general sponsorship stuff, let alone like when you get into like the structure function claims and, and, and things like that. So you get into this like weird phase where you obviously want to use it because there's a ton of attention and people are going on there. And, and, and obviously like TikTok is also um, incentivizing a lot of the customers orders and like getting people to like try this out and get used to it. And you get, you get excited and you start going and you don't think about the risk layers. You just think about the positives and you go, I'm going to make it rich. And you don't think about the other side, but I'm seeing, that that could potentially be a big problem soon. Today is, it's such, so interesting because like social media keeps upping the speed at which information is, right? You know, you look at like a Facebook to an Instagram to TikTok, like the rates at which you post, the, the, the uh, length of time things are up, like, just the sheer volume of information you're exposed to just keeps getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster, right? And it does create one of the biggest opportunities for uh, obviously misinformation, right? Like this is something that we're talking about in the political realm, but just in all forms of advertising, just misinformation, whether it's intentional or not, right? Um, and, you know, I do think the FTC has not 100% caught up with the way people are actually utilizing social media these days. Um, and I do think that it does create a lot of opportunities for a lot of people to put things that aren't true out there. Now they try, like this, sometimes you can't use certain keywords and all this type of stuff, but like, um, you know, when you're talking about like doing a story and having a link and you're, you're 
passing this out to like a thousand creators and they're making a video about it, um, it does lead to a lot of misinformation. From a company standpoint, I think what is super important and I think has to be done is when you're engaging in one of these sort of like, you know, revenue share type, we're going to pass this out to a ton of creators and ask you to make a video about it. You got to give them great messaging points. You know, you got to give them great guidelines on what to say about the product and not to say about it. I, I think it's the company's responsibility. Um, you know, and right now, you know, it's offending information of some third party and the, that's taken down. But I, I do think, you know, until like there becomes much more clarity and um, like a straight line type of, of liability for these companies for stuff that's kind of like put out there through affiliates, um, you're not going to see people clamp down really well because look, I mean, like you said, everybody's fighting this algorithm, you know, and they're just trying to get to the top and, and it's very easy to lose sight of, you know, Hey, would you put this on your website? Would you put this in print? You know, when we're talking about, you know, a TikTok story that, you know, might be relevant for a couple of days or not, you know, if it's trying to go viral or, or an Instagram story that's going to be on for 24 hours. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's talk about the wild west and that's where it exists right now in CPG and our ability to sort of market, spread info. But is getting caught up in the health misinformation loops enough for your functional CPG brand to totally give up on the potentially powerful TikTok made me buy it effect? Using that weird baby and bathwater idiom again, no matter what happens with the TikTok ban, I don't see a future without social commerce. It has now become too entrenched, too popular, and too valuable within the US market. So it might not be easy come, easy go yet, but it's time to hedge those TikTok shop bets by opening your aperture up a bit. In November, details were leaked on a Amazon and Meta partnership where customers would be able to shop Amazon's Facebook and Instagram ads and check out with Amazon without leaving the social media apps. Customers will see real-time pricing, prime eligibility, delivery estimates, and product details on select Amazon product ads in Facebook and Instagram as part of this new experience. In my opinion, this could be a game changer as Amazon and Meta have some of the richest consumer behavioral data sets available, giving this data fusion the opportunity to create significant advertising effectiveness. But just in closing, as social commerce continues its rapid ascent, it cannot be overstated enough that functional CPG brands must adapt their digital strategies to fully exploit these emerging sales channels, which should be more broadly considered customer relationship channels to maintain a competitive edge in this increasingly dynamic business landscape. Well, I hope you enjoyed this YouTube video. If you did, consider hitting that like button to support me. Also help me get to my new short-term goal of 4,000 subscribers by hitting that subscribe button. I'd love to see you join me on this journey, but we need to fix the fact that slightly more than 90% of you that are watching this YouTube video right now are not subscribed to my channel, and that makes me extremely sad. But I do want to thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.